Welcome back, everybody. It's good to be here and continue studying the book of Revelation. And we're in chapter 4 now, so if you would, turn to Revelation chapter 4. And there's only 11 verses, so this is kind of a short chapter, but there's a lot of things hidden in this chapter, a lot of good nuggets, if you will, a lot of interesting things. Now, I gave you two handouts. We'll probably look at these handouts. I might just save this one till the end because uh, I want you to kind of get in your head, in your mind, um, an idea of what it's explaining here. And then afterwards, I'll show you what I tried to show, <laughs> and it's probably not even close. But I, I wasn't going to do any handouts, but I just felt like, wow, maybe we need to, to see examples of things he's talking about. So we're going to look at some handouts, too. What I want to do today, though, is read chapter 4, and what we're going to do is we're going to get a glimpse of heaven, chapter 4. We just read in chapter 2 and 3 about things down here on earth. Now it all changes to things up in heaven. So remember that we looked at the seven churches last time. We finished that up. And remember the three applications of the book of Revelation that we've seen. It's past. John is literally writing the seven churches in, in that time when he was alive. It's present because it's all about the church age, the seven church, uh, we'd call them periods, I guess. And then it's also future, the book of Revelation. Because we see a great change here in chapter 4. And we see something taking place, and now it's all about things that are future for us. Until we get to the very end of the book, where again he talks to the church again and things like that. So what we see in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 is a door opened in heaven. Now what is that a type of? That's a type of the rapture. Because you just had the churches, and then... Boom, rapture. So you have the church, the rapture, then the tribulation. Okay, I have to say that. Some people say, no, the church is going through the tribulation. I don't see that. I don't see that in the Bible, not according to Paul. Remember, Paul is our apostle, and God gave a lot of revelation to the apostle Paul. So we always need to go back to what God revealed to Paul as well. So the open door in heaven is a type of the rapture. So from here on in the book of Revelation, it's about things that are happening after the rapture. And until the end where he pleads with readers now to come to Jesus. So I see a lot of future events coming up. So let's begin in verse 1 and it says, after this, after what? After the church. So we could say and apply this spiritually, after the church age, there's the rapture. And then after the rapture is the tribulation. And then after the tribulation, it ends with Armageddon and Jesus coming back and ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. So I always have to say this because there's so many people out there that don't believe it and always just want to argue and fight with you. And it's so sad to me. But the first coming of Jesus Christ was in two parts. He was born of a virgin, lived 33 years, rose again, and then came back down. And he was here until he went up in Acts chapter 1, um, I believe on Pentecost. So there's two parts to the first coming of Jesus. So there must be two parts to the second coming of Jesus. The first part is the rapture. When those that are His are taken up to heaven, then comes the tribulation, the last part of Daniel's 70th week. Then we're up there with them. We come back with Him at Armageddon. That's the second part of the second coming. So first advent, we use sometimes the word advent. First coming, first advent of Jesus, two parts. Second advent, second coming of Jesus, two parts. And we're going to see that. And what a great thing that it shows us here that church age ends with the rapture. And it says here, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So that would be a type of Jesus coming at the rapture. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay? Now what do we do with those people that say the whole book is past? <laughs> uh, these are still future things for us. And uh, so he says there, there's a door open in heaven. Again, I can't stress it enough, type of the rapture. Heard a trumpet like a voice. Hmm, trumpet. What does the Bible say about the rapture? Um, well, let's look at a couple verses, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, Paul tells us that the rapture is at the last trump, and the trump is the sound that a trumpet makes. And people all the time I've seen in comments on my videos, but all over YouTube, and it seems like all over the world, People are getting into churches and saying, there's no such thing as a rapture. There's no such thing as a rapture. And yet it's right here in chapter 4, and we see it in type. But in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, 
Paul is speaking of the rapture. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means they're dead. Their body is sleeping in the grave. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Now how is He bringing them with them if they're in the grave? Their souls are in heaven, of those that are saved. Their bodies are in the grave. So when Jesus comes at the rapture, He brings their souls back while their bodies resurrect and go back together. So the soul goes back into their body and they get a glorified body. So they're coming in the clouds, they get it, and they go back up. You all understand that? It's so simple if you just read it. And it says, um, Which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. So there's a sound that's made from a trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now how is that Armageddon? In Armageddon, Jesus comes back on the ground, defeats His enemies, and rules on the earth for a thousand years. He doesn't go back up. So somebody's caught up to heaven. What is that? The rapture. <laughs> I don't understand these people who say there's no rapture. And it says in verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. So it's a great comfort to know that we're getting out of here. Now some people want to take away your comfort. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Someone just sent me an email. Said, Brother Breaker, I talked to so and so on the phone and he's this guy on, um, that's a well-known preacher and he doesn't believe in the rapture anymore. And they said, I want you to debate him, Brother Breaker. I go, no. No, that, that wouldn't, all debates are is to get people in the flesh and give their opinions and things like that. It, that would make him look bad in the eyes of some people and make me look bad in the eyes of other people. I don't, I don't like debates. Let him do his ministry, let me do mine, and we'll see in heaven. You know what I mean? But I do believe in the rapture, and it's sad to me that people don't believe in the rapture. And what are they doing? They're taking away our blessed hope. Because the rapture is our blessed hope. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you take away my hope? Because the only hope I have is the rapture. Otherwise, what do I have to look forward to? The Antichrist giving me a mark? No thanks, no thanks. Or dying as a martyr for Jesus? Okay, if it comes to that, I'm happy. But I don't see how we can go through the tribulation if we're the church and we're the dispensation that was hidden and that was revealed to Paul and that we're supposed to get out so that God goes back to dealing with Israel. And when you read verses like we just read, it makes it very clear. We go up with the Lord. He doesn't come down and then set up His kingdom and we're all down here. Why would we be going up then? You see how they don't, that doesn't work? There must be two parts to the second coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning there in verse 51, Behold, I show you a what? Mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So it's a mystery that was revealed to Paul. Now, I think Jesus alluded to it a couple times in the book of John. Uh, but this is something that was a mystery revealed to Paul, the mystery of the rapture. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So at the rapture we get a glorified body. How could that possibly be at the end of the tribulation, as some people teach? I don't want a glorified body if I have to go through the tribulation. I want to stay in my normal body to go through the millennium too. But no, we get out here and get the glorified body and then come back here and reign with Jesus. So you've got to believe in a rapture if you're going to rightly divide the word of truth. Because dispensations prove the rapture. Now I'll get more into that here in a minute. Oh, there are so many people today that hate the doctrine of the rapture. And I think it's because they want to be like heroes or something over here. I fought the Antichrist. You know, that's their mentality of their anger and, 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 and they just want to go fight. But God's given us what? We're supposed to have peace and meekness and kindness. So uh, are they even saved? Maybe they are. They're just wrong on their doctrine. So I told somebody the other day, I said, well, if they're against the rapture and they believe we're going through the tribulation and they're preaching a faith and works gospel, they're wrong now, but as soon as the rapture comes, they'll be right. And they go, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, so it's kind of funny how God's preparing them to preach the right thing in a different dispensation. <laughs> and we're almost there. So God wins either way. Amen. So we have 
here, let's go back to Revelation chapter 4, but we have here something mentioned, and it's a trumpet blowing. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, verse 1 of chapter 4. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. So this makes me think about the rapture, and what will we hear at the rapture? And I think there's four things that we're going to hear at the rapture. First one we saw in the passage would be the sound of a trumpet. So uh, I'll put trumpet sound. We'll hear a trumpet sound. So have you ever thought about that? I mean, I'm looking for the rapture, but do you know what to look for? Have you ever thought that you'd just be at work someday or, or working, and the rapture comes and you hear, boop, 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 and you'd be like, did you hear that? Hear what? I thought I heard a trumpet. And it says the last trump. So you think maybe it might blow twice, once for the dead, once for the living perhaps? I don't, but wouldn't that be, boop, 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 and you're like, and some people have thought about, well, how long between the two? Remember when Jesus rose from the dead back here? It was three days later he rose, but there were some people that rose when he rose. How long did those people that rose walk around? Because it says they appeared in the city, those that rose from the dead with Jesus. What if at the rapture they rose first, the dead, and got to walk around for a little bit and tell everybody, hey, guess what? I'm a Christian and I'm back and Jesus is real. And then, boop, 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 and then, then we all go. Just a thought, how long in between there? I don't know. But are you waiting for a trumpet sound? I am. And I don't know. When I think of a trumpet, I think of a brass instrument, you know. But what was the trumpet in Israel? It was this long horn. And it's like, you know, kind of a blast. Boy, that would scare you in the morning, wouldn't it? You'd be jumping out of bed, um, hitting your head on the ceiling. But uh, that's the first thing that, that will take place. Then what else? Well, I think Jesus will call your name because he knows his sheep by name. And I got to really move here today because I got a lot. So if you want to look that up, look up John chapter 10 and verse 16 and then verse 27. He says, I know my sheep and I know them by name. So I think he'll give your name. So you'll hear a trumpet blow and then your name. Remember the Old Testament, Samuel? And God said, Samuel, Samuel. Now, will he say it twice like that? I don't know, but you'll hear your name. Wouldn't that be amazing? Now, what's the next thing you'll hear? Well, we don't have time to go there, but in Luke chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 30, also in chapter 2 and verse 10, I think it's an angel, if I remember the context, shows up. And the first thing that it says is, fear not. And you see all throughout the Bible, it seems like when an angel shows up or when Jesus shows up to someone, the first thing he says is fear not. Why? Because they were probably going to be really scared. Now, now Jesus is, is risen from the dead. Well, when somebody dies and then you see him later, what do you think of? You think of a ghost. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is a ghost, but if my dad were to knock on the door today and I'd open the door, I'd be like, oh, it's a ghost. It can't be him, right? So what would be the first thing he'd say? Fear not, right? Because, hey, don't be afraid. Let me tell you what's happening here. And we see that throughout the Bible in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, I believe, as Jesus says, fear not. In Acts 27, 24, Jesus says to Paul, fear not. So fear not. So trumpet blow your name, fear not. And then what's the next thing? Well, back to Revelation chapter 4, it said, come up hither. So, what a neat thing, come up hither. And I think if you speak English, Jesus is going to say, come up hither. Just like the King James Bible. I don't know what new versions say. Wouldn't that be funny if, if uh, Jesus said, come up hither, and all these people that were saved but had another Bible would go, oh man, my Bible was wrong. So there you go. But come up hither. Hither means here with me. So, come up hither. So that will be interesting when the rapture takes place. Now Revelation 4.1, but also Revelation 11.12, we see that again. And we see here another rapture, if you will. And you want to do a fun study, look up my video on YouTube entitled, uh, The Seven Raptures in the Bible. This, I think, is the two witnesses, if I remember correctly, in uh, verse 12 of chapter 11. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So there's a second rapture. <laughs> there's actually seven raptures in the Bible. But I was studying, I'm like, seven this, seven that, seven everything. And the, there's got to be seven raptures. And this is the two witnesses. So I think there's seven raptures in the Bible. But uh, so here we have come up hither. So I see 
This is a type of the rapture, Revelation 4, the door open in heaven. And it just makes me think about what we'll hear when the rapture comes. And what an amazing thing that will be. Now, when does the trumpet blow? 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, at the last trump. Now, some people say, well, that trumpet, brother breaker, is in the book of Revelation and the seven trumpets that blow. And so, so you have to go through the tribulation until that last trump. Why is that wrong? Well, first of all, Paul says the last trump, let me should give you the exact date. I'll turn over to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He writes 1 Corinthians 15 in about 59. Okay, I was going to say 60 AD. In about 59 AD. So in 59 AD, he says the last trump, the rapture is coming. <coughs> Nobody knew about the seven trumpets of Revelation because it hadn't been revealed yet. Revelation is written about 95 to 100 AD. So how could Paul be referencing something that nobody knew about yet? To me, that doesn't make sense. I don't see Paul saying, yeah, when we go at the end of the tribulation, where's the comfort in that? <laughs> I don't see it. Do you see it? So I don't think he was talking about the seven trumpets. Now, what other time would there be a trumpet? Well, there's trumpets in heaven. There's also trumpets on earth. So I've always thought and always adhered to the thought that the last trump would be probably one of the feasts of Israel in which a trumpet is blown during their feasts. And lo and behold, there's a feast called the what? The Feast of Trumpets. And did you know that the last blow of that trumpet they call the last trump? So I do not adhere to these teachers that say we go through the tribulation and the last trump is at the end of the tribulation and then is the rapture. I, I can't buy that. I can't swallow that because that doesn't jive. They're talking about a trumpet up there. What if Paul's talking about one down here? And, and Paul is all over those feasts, and he says they're types of Christ. And so uh, we have the feast of, of Passover. Christ was the Passover lamb. First fruits, you know, Christ is first fruits. So uh, that's my thought on it. But what do they do? They, they go over to Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And they say in Matthew chapter 24, well, here's Jesus speaking, and Jesus says uh, about this trumpet. And so this is when the rapture is. Well, there's a problem with that. Somebody is not rightly dividing. And by the way, these people that are against the rapture, they don't rightly divide and they don't believe in dispensations. There's your problem right there. Dispensations are in the Bible. And guess what? They didn't begin with Darby. One of the greatest lies ever hatched out of hell is people run around saying, nobody taught dispensations until Darby in the 1800s. Why don't you get the book, Dispensations Before Darby? <laughs> and maybe you'll just like, Stop spreading lies, okay? I, I'm sorry, I just get a little sad that people, because they're trying to overthrow our blessed hope by taking it away from us. Uh, I can't have that. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 31, look what it says. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24, and who's he speaking to? He's, he's speaking to the Jews about what's going to happen before he comes in in his kingdom. And in verse 31, Jesus says, And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So people say, see, that's the rapture. And that's the last trumpet of revelation. So that's when the rapture is. Yeah, that sounds like that, doesn't it? If we were to pull that out of context. And that's exactly what they do. There's called the rule of context where you read at least three verses before and at least three verses after to get the context. So let's back up to verse 29. Are you ready for this? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Does that sound like the rapture to you? What does that sound like? Armageddon. So Jesus is talking about Armageddon, not about before the tribulation. The rapture comes before the tribulation. So what is this? This is trumpets in heaven blowing, and the elect would be who? Israel. You see, in the Bible it talks about the elect. Sometimes the elect is the nation of Israel. Sometimes the elect is us who are saved. And the context will always tell you which one it is. How do we know that the elect here is not us who are saved? It's Israel. Very next verse. Verse 32. Now learn the parable of the what? fig tree. Who's the fig tree? Israel. So this is not a rapture at the end of the tribulation. This is 
God going to gather together the Jews to rule over them in the millennial kingdom. Do you see that? So it's just so sad to me to see so many people today turning from what they once believed and teaching something that's not true. And many of them used to be independent fundamentalists, I'm excuse me, fundamental Baptists. And uh, many of them um, used to believe in the rapture. And now they say, but I don't believe in the rapture anymore. How could you believe in it and not believe in it anymore? Well, they have gotten rid of dispensations. So the Bible says, Paul says, in the last days there will be a falling away. Remember that? He does not say, in the last days there will be a finally getting it right. <laughs> So when I read my Bible, I see the church believing something, and in the last days they turn from what they once believed. That's Bible. But these guys want to tell you, no, 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 those people that believe in the pre-trib rapture, and uh, all those people were wrong, but we finally got it right. Now follow me, because I'm going to tell you the truth. We finally got it right. Does that sound right to you, or does that sound like a cult? By their own admission, they're telling you, I used to believe that, but I don't anymore. Oh, so you're the one that fell away. I shouldn't join you then, right? <laughs> That's the way I see it, just by reading the Bible. But let me show you what it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. There's no way that we that are saved are going into the tribulation. Because the tribulation is seven years, I believe. And I might even have time to show you that today. And so it's three and a half years and three and a half years. Now, I've told you before, the last half of the tribulation, this last three and a half years, is called the Great Tribulation. This is when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth with the bowls and the vials and, the, and all that stuff when He pours out His wrath. So that's when the wrath is poured out, the last half of the tribulation. Watch what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. <laughs> Does that sound like we're going through the tribulation? but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we're not appointed to wrath, how do we go through the tribulation? I mean, if you want to follow those people that don't believe in the rapture, you help yourself, but you're wrong. Because the rapture is the only hope we have. Have you seen how awful the world is? And you want to stay here? <laughs> no, Jesus, come get us. Jesus, please take us out. So why a rapture at the end of the tribulation? Um, there are three theories about the rapture, okay? And I'm sure you all know this, but for the sake of those who don't, there are people that preach the pre-trib rapture, okay? Pre-tribulation, which means the rapture comes before the tribulation. That's what I believe. And I believe that because that's what Paul said. Now, a lot of these folks that are post-tribbers that don't believe in a rapture or they say, well, the rapture comes at the end, a lot of those people, they say, well, no one ever believed in a pre-trib rapture except for um, when Darby started. So no one believed in a pre-trib rapture until Darby, they say. And someone wrote a book or something, and they said no one believed in a pre-trib rapture until Darby because Darby was some preacher in the 1800s, and they had a meeting, and, and supposedly they said that, that some girl there had a dream and said pre-trib rapture. And all these things are made up. How do we know that someone preached a pre-trib rapture before Darby? Because Paul did in the Bible. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> I mean, so the, anytime they say no one preached a pre-trib rapture until Darby, you can mark her down that is an absolute lie. And that person is lying. Okay? Because Paul taught it. But they say, no, but we don't find anyone else in church history ever teaching that. Another lie. Okay? I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. I've got it at home somewhere. A guy named Ken Johnson wrote a book. And it's called the rapture, the pre-tribulational rapture. And he goes into the church fathers, the early church fathers. He shows you 100, 200, 300 years after Jesus, there are people preaching the pre-trib rapture. So how could anyone say no one preached a pre-trib rapture before Darby when we have historical records of people saying, and we get out before the, day, the, the horrible day of wrath and all that stuff. Someone is lying to you. Please don't follow the liars. Please be careful and don't follow people that will lie to you. Now they say, well, how come we don't have it from here to here until 1800? Again, what happened? The Dark Ages from 500 to 1500, most people couldn't read. So you think we're going to find books about the pre-trib rapture? The Inquisition. If true believers believed it, the Catholic Church would have said no, because they believed in replacement theology, they would have killed them. So we start to see it. 
here from the 1800s on. But in that book, Dispensations Before Darby, you'll see it in the 1600s, 1500s. People believed in dispensations. So, yes, there has always been true believers that believed in a pre-trib rapture. Okay? I cannot stress it enough, and it's just so sad to me how people today can get away with lies so easily. And so many people let them get away with that lie. They need to be held accountable for that lie. Don't you lie to us and tell us there's no pre-trib rapture before 1800. That's a lie, and you know you're lying when you say it. Amen. Yes, it is. So, did I... Did I did I stress that enough? Okay, can we move on? But it just, it's sad because that's our only hope to get out of this world before the Antichrist. And you want to take that from me? Why don't you just kick me in the gut while you're at it? He's my Savior, but He's also my husband. And I'm supposed to marry Him. What if I came up to you and says, there's no marriage. <laughs> and you're a single person. You're like, man, I can't ever get married. No, there's no such thing as marriage. I mean, wouldn't that stress you out because you just want to get married and have kids and be happy? I mean, that's what they're doing, trying to take away your hope. So then there's people that believe a mid-trib rapture. And they say, well, no, see, we go through the first three and a half years and we get out in the middle. And they have their verses on that. I don't see that. I see a pre-trib rapture. And I see that for many, many reasons in the Bible. And then we have the post-trib rapture. And the post-trib rapture, people say, and it's really not even, that doesn't even make sense. Because they believe the rapture is not at the end, but almost at the end. So it's not even a post-trib. It's, it's an almost end of trib. They don't even say it right. They believe in an almost end of the trib rapture. But they, you know, they're not going to call it that. So which of those do you believe? Now, Paul taught dispensations and things that were revealed to him about the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is also called the bride of Christ. Now let me show you some verses real quick on that because I want you to have this and understand this. And uh, 2 Corinthians, I've noticed some of my comments where i am um, got new videos up. Usually I get great comments. Lately I've noticed a lot of people come there just to argue. And it's been a real blessing to me to see how many of my viewers are right doctrinally and they'll just like, comment back. No, what about this verse? What about this verse? And usually those people go away. <laughs> so a lot of people just want an argument. I don't want an argument. I just want truth. Amen. But it says in 2 Corinthians eleven two, for I am jealous over you. This is Paul speaking to the church. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So we are espoused to Christ the church, the body of Christ. What does that mean? That means we're going to marry Him one day. The book of Revelation talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we are the body of Christ, the church. We are spouse to Christ. We're not married yet, but we will be. And that's what the rapture is for. Now go to Ephesians chapter 5. So if that's the case, then Jesus is coming at the rapture for what? For His bride. Are you telling me Mr. Mid-Tribber or Post-Tribber, are you telling me that Jesus is like, you know what, I love you, but if you just go ahead and go over with this guy and shack up with him for seven years, then I'll come marry you. How would you be a chaste virgin? <laughs> Wouldn't, I mean, isn't that part of being a man you want to protect somebody? Not, uh, well, you go do whatever you want, and then I'll see you in seven years and we'll get married. And, you know, it doesn't matter who soils you or, or rapes you or does bad things. Do you really think Jesus would do that to his bride? So I don't understand this argument of a, of a post-trib or mid-trib. But in Ephesians chapter 5, look what it says. Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. And I wish I had time to read all this, but look what it says here in verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Now wait a minute. Remember in the book of Revelation when they take the mark of the beast? What do they get? A grievous sore. Sounds like a spot, doesn't it? Are you telling me that I can be a Christian and take the mark of the beast and then God's going to accept me <laughs> even though I have a spot? I don't think so. I don't even see how a Christian could go into the tribulation in order to get the mark of the beast, even have that temptation. We have to leave first. But it continues there and it says, um, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So this is the body of Christ. So I see a pre-trib rapture. Now let's go uh, back to Revelation. This time go to Revelation chapter 13. So when is the church presented to Christ? 
it'd have to be at the rapture pre-trib because now we're still holy and without blemish, haven't taken the mark of the beast, and we go up. Why would Jesus give his fiance to the devil first and let her take the mark of the beast? It doesn't make sense logically nor biblically. Now, mid-trib rapture. These people say, no, we go halfway through the tribulation. Well, I don't see that either. And let me show you a quick verse, Revelation chapter 13. Oh, I'd love to read verse 1 through, through 9. If you want to, pause this and, and read all that. But it's talking about the beast and how his, his wounded to death, the beast. Now, look down in verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to, what's the next word? Continue 40 and 2 months. Continue means keep doing what you're already doing. <laughs> so I see the Antichrist going three and a half years as the man of sin. Then he is assassinated. And then he comes back, literally the son of perdition, Satan in him, and continues for 42 months or three and a half years. So I see a seven-year tribulation. And I don't see us being here. I see us leaving. Because over there in Thessalonians, it says that um, the Antichrist be revealed, the man of sin, comma, the son of perdition. So when he's revealed as the man of sin for the first three and a half years, right then we get out. He, he rules for three and a half years. Then he's revealed as the son of perdition. There's two revelations in Thessalonians. You know what I'm talking about, the passage? Is that first or second Thessalonians for those that want to go there and read it? And uh, Paul is telling us about that. And I'm wondering why so many people are changing on that. It's just simply right there in the Bible. I believe it's 2 Thessalonians 2. Is that right? Yeah, 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, verse 3, for that day, what day? The rapture shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. Why does he have two names? Because the Antichrist comes as the man of sin for the first three and a half years, and as soon as he's revealed in the world, we're out of here. He rules for three and a half years, and then he becomes the son of perdition when he's killed over in Revelation. And then he continues. Now, I don't know in English, but in Spanish Bibles, they take out the word continue. That's why I use the Valera Purificada. It's the only one that has continue. I'm sure probably in English, some of these perversions change the word continue. It's kind of sad, but I haven't looked into that. But be careful of new versions of the Bible in any language. So we see this, and we see has to be a pre-trib so that the Antichrist can get his full seven years divided in half, three and a half, three and a half, man of sin, son of perdition. Now, some people want to believe in a post-trib rapture. But why endure to the end just to get raptured when you could rule with Jesus on earth in your natural body? Why would you even go to heaven if you could just wait it out and then go into here? I mean, isn't that like almost punishment? Jesus comes back and you made it through the tribulation. I made it, Lord. I made it. And God goes, well, too bad. Let me change you into a glorified body. <laughs> no, but can I stay alive in the body I'm in? Nope. Good. I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever that that would happen because the Bible says we will rule and reign with him. We go up here at the judgment seat of Christ, get our rewards, and then we come back and rule and reign with him at Armageddon. So I do not see a post-trib rapture. The post-trib rapture was something that was taught by many, many, many churches that had no idea of dispensations. And they mixed the law and grace, and they had a faith and works gospel. And many of them preached the endure to the end. So they're thinking, hey, I believe in Jesus, but i got to do works. You know what? That's faith and work. That's not salvation. So were they saved? I don't know. I'm not saying who's saved and who isn't. But I know one thing. It's not faith and works today. It's faith alone. And we must believe in dispensations. So the rapture must come first, then seven years for Israel, then Armageddon, and the thousand-year reign of Christ. So the battle of Armageddon. So back to Revelation chapter 4. Whew. Oh, what did we get into? A whole lot, right? Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. There is your rapture in type. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. So that gives us an idea of, you know, what, what's going to happen at the rapture. We looked at that. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So these must be things that are taking place after the rapture. But where is this taking place? All that we're going to read in chapter 4 is things that are taking place in heaven. So God lets him go up to heaven and see something. 
And what he sees is a wild scene. I'm still, my head's still spinning. I, I tried to get on the computer and, and make a graphic of what I actually saw, <laughs> or what he actually saw. And I'm still scratching my head because it sounds kind of weird. But, I mean, I'm sure, well, yeah, I'm sure it, it, is, it is weird. But I want you to be prepared when you go up at the rapture what you'll see in heaven. You'll probably be like, oh, I read that in the Bible. Oh, there's that. Oh, there's that. I mean, look for these things. It's good to know these things. And immediately I was in the spirit and beheld a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. OK, so immediately the rapture is immediate, it sounds like, at least for us who are alive. And we go up immediately. And who do you think the one that sat on the throne was? Well, I think it was Jesus. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine or sardine, however you want to say it. I'll say sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So look at our handout here. And I thought this was amazing. Um, I'm not big into gems and things like that. I did work at a jewelry store for two years in high school. But jaspers can come in different colors. And here we see some example of jasper stones. Here we see some examples of sardine stones. And then some examples of emeralds, just to give you an idea of emerald. We live here on the emerald coast, don't we? You go out to the beach, the water is so green. Um, if you ever go offshore, though, it's all blue, just this beautiful blue. So jasper is an opaque variety of chalcedony stone. It can be red, green, blue, brown, purple, or yellow. But usually it's kind of reddish is probably the most common. And what would that remind us of? The blood of Jesus, amen? And sardine stone is a type of limestone often found in Sardinia, Italy. It's usually reddish, but can have pink, brown, or white too. So interesting. So when you think about this, you, you see Jesus and he's kind of opaque. Can you kind of see through him? Because it's an opaque stone. And he's got kind of a reddish tint to him. So that's interesting. Now remember, verse 2, he's in the spirit. So he's seeing Jesus in the spirit world. You know we're in the physical world, right? And then there's a spiritual world too. There's two worlds. And... Um, the way to be in both at once is to be saved. Because if you're unsaved, you're just in this world. But when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. Now you're in both worlds at once. It's kind of wild. And now God can direct your path in this world. So make sure you get saved and have the Holy Spirit. Now the next thing we see up here is verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, many people ask, who are these twenty-four elders? You know my answer? I don't know. <laughs> but I can guess, but that's all this is, is a guess. I may be right, I might be wrong. But would you like to know who I'm, over the years studying this, whom I think it could be? I'm not certain, so I'm going to make sure I say I'm not certain, but who do I think it would be? Well... The only thing I can come up with, God always does things like in symmetry, symmetrical. So whenever there's something that takes place in the Old Testament, in the Bible, there's always something in the New Testament that corresponds with that. Have you ever noticed that? Whatever you read in the New Testament, it seems like there's always something like that in the Old Testament. So my first thought would be, well, 12 would have to be from the Old Testament, 12 from the New Testament, right? That would make 24. Maybe that's who it is. So who would it be from the Old Testament? Well, turn over to Numbers to the book of Numbers. And in the Old Testament, there were 12 who God made into princes. Could these 12 be the 12 uh, elders? And um, then there'd have to be another 12. Who would that be? We'll see here in a minute. But the book of Numbers, and uh, chapter 1, Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1, we read... Oh, let's see. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were coming out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male by their poles. From twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And with you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one head of the house of his fathers. All right. So how many tribes in Israel? Twelve, Twelve tribes of Israel. Okay. And these are the names of the men that shall stand with you of the tribe of Reuben, Ele Eliezer. Of the, now I'm not going to read all these, but he gives you the names of the heads of the 12 tribes. 
Verse 16, these were the renowned of the congregation, princes of the tribes of their fathers, heads of thousands in Israel. So could it be, and I don't know, uh, let's skip over to verse 44 real quick, same chapter. These are those that were numbered, which Moses and Aaron numbered, and the princes of Israel being 12 men, each one was for the house of their fathers. So could the 24 elders, could 12 of them have been these men? that were the head of each tribe of Israel? That's the only thought I have on who possibly, but that's only 12. So who would the other 12 be? Well, we have the 12 apostles. So you'd have 12 in the New Testament, 12 in the Old Testament, that makes 24. And where else are you going to put them? I guess God put them there to remind them of Old Testament, New Testament. They're witnesses of a covenant. Remember? Old Testament covenant, New Testament covenant. Perhaps that's what it is. Um, let's look at that in... Um, uh, let me see, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Now certainly, God did not forget the 12 disciples or the 12 uh, apostles. And uh, He's going to do something with them. Did you know God's not done with them? Yes, they're dead, but they're going to resurrect someday. And guess what? God's going to use them in the millennial kingdom. Did you know that? So Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, that sounds like here in the millennium, they're on twelve thrones. So why wouldn't they already be up there on twelve? You see what I'm saying? Doesn't that sound like it to you? Uh, turn over to Luke 22.30. Luke 22.30. So this is my best guess on it. I'm not teaching this dogmatically, but... Uh, this is my best guess on who they could be. And it's just that, a guess. Luke twenty two thirty. 30. Luke chapter 22 and verse 30. Jesus says that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. When would his kingdom be? Millennial kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it sounds like to me that's probably my best guess of who the 24 elders would be. Twelve Old Testament princes of Israel from each tribe during the time of Moses. Well, the law started with Moses. And twelve New Testament apostles. All right, the law started with Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. So Moses' people and Jesus' people, twelve and twelve. That's the only thing I can come up to. Now we get into a whole another big thing. But there's 13 apostles, or maybe 14, you know. Okay, Judas was not really an apostle. Okay, so we get rid of him. And then in the Bible, in the book of Acts, Matthias is elected as another apostle by the apostles. We never hear him again in the Bible. So did man elect Matthias or did God? They cast lots. <laughs> that sounds like betting, right? You cast lots, you know. Uh, let's roll the dice and see. You, you know, you don't, you don't go by that. So could it have been Paul? Because Paul tells us, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, that God called him to be an apostle. So my thought is that the, the 12th apostle is Paul and that God didn't really accept Matthias. Now, people will argue, oh, and, and help yourself. You know, again, I'm not teaching this dogmatically, but there's got to be 12. And I'll show you why there has to be only 12 apostles. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7 through 10. And after that, it says, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. What is he? An apostle. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Paul is an apostle. Romans eleven thirteen. 13, he says he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Romans chapter 1, 1. Quickly, let's look at this. So, it can't be denied that Paul was an apostle. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, he tells us. Now, I, I, I can't tell you how many debates I get into, and I don't want to be in debates, but people just want to argue. And one of the things people argue is, well, Paul wasn't an ordained apostle of God. And yet, I'm like, dude, can you not read the scripture? He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now flip over to 1 Corinthians 1, 1. So yeah, God called Paul. How would you say otherwise? 
Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Now, since you're turning, go to Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. I hear this more and more lately, and it just, oh, it must be the devil getting into people and trying to get them to turn from the truth. And it just shows me people don't read their Bible. Because you read your Bible, you can't believe this. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. <laughs> and yet I hear people try to say, well, Brother Breaker, you're so wrong. Paul was not an apostle of God. He set himself up as an apostle, and we shouldn't listen to him because he didn't preach true doctrine. He, he infiltrated the church as a wolf, and he's not. And there's people out there that are anti-Paul and say Paul shouldn't be in the Bible. Well, I'd hate to be in their shoes at the judgment. Because God will go, turn to Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, please. <laughs> Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Amen. Now, go to Revelation chapter 21. Let me show you this. I made a statement earlier where I said I think there's only 12 apostles. Well, I think there's only 12 main apostles in the mind of God that He counts as the 12 apostles. And the reason I say that is Revelation 21, 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. That's who? The body of Christ. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So this is New Jerusalem. Having the glory... Of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. Okay, here's stone again, jasper. And had a wall great and high and had twelve gates. See, even God built a wall. Why didn't our country have one? He's trying to keep out some certain people. Hmm. Anyway, and had a wall, sinners, by the way, trying to keep out sinners. You know, Mexico's in a war right now with the, with the drug mafia people. What are they called? The cartels. And yet, we're not supposed to have a a wall in our border? Don't we want to be protected from sinners? Anyway, thank God He put a wall in heaven that sinners can't come in. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Well, there's your twelve tribes, and their names. So, like I said, twenty-four elders, probably, my guess, the twelve elders are princes. But then look at the next. On the east three gates, and the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Now verse 14. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Not thirteen, so twelve. Some people will argue with you, but Paul's not there. Okay, Matthias is. When we get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do is, okay, where's New Jerusalem? Uh, I'm going to read through there, Peter, James, and uh, aha, Paul, you know. Or I'm going to be like, oh, man, Matthias, okay, you know. But um, we'll find out then, I guess, won't we? But uh, doesn't that make sense, reading that, to make you think perhaps that the 24 elders would have to be 12 in the Old Testament, 12 in the New Testament, the princes of Israel and the apostles of Jesus Christ? Just throwing that out there for you. Back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, excuse me, chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. So we read verse 4. So now let's start in verse 5. Verse 4 is about the 24 elders. And by the way, it's not done speaking about the 24 elders. Verse 10 mentions them again. And we'll see these again here in a minute. But it gives us more of a, of a, of a glimpse of heaven. It says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That's weird, isn't it? So it sounds like a place where you'd kind of be scared a little bit, wouldn't you? Can you imagine a lost sinner standing there having to give account of himself to God at the judgment? Sounds like a pretty solemn place. And it says, okay, now I don't have time to get into the seven lamps, but Revelation 1-4, real quick, look at Revelation 1-4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and and from the seven spirits which are before His throne. Okay, seven lamps, seven spirits. Revelation 3, 1. And at the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Okay. And the seven stars. Hmm. All right, now flip over to 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven 
horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on. I, I can't explain everything in the book of Revelation. We'll just have to be there to see it. But seven spirits are also seven lamps, and there's seven stars, and stars are angels. Angels are appearances. So I don't know. I, I haven't got all this together. Have you? I've never met anyone yet that's understood completely the book of Revelation. But God knows what He's doing. All I know is He likes the number seven a lot. So go back to Revelation now, chapter 4. And uh, it says, which are the seven spirits of God? Now we go down to verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Well, that's kind of odd, isn't it? you got four beasts. And we're going to look at these four beasts, but they have eyes all over them. I mean, that almost sounds like a monster to me. <laughs> what is this? Well, I don't know. Uh, remember, the Bible says God's ways are past finding out. We in our little mortal bodies, we can't figure this out. All we know is that's what it says. And you know what? I believe it because it says it. I don't have to understand it, but I believe it because God said it. That settles it, right? That's how it should be. And what I tried to do was make this handout because as I was going through here doing this study, I decided I'd, I'd draw out what I see. And what a weird picture. The first thing I did was put the throne there with a rainbow around it. And the first thing I thought was Looney Tunes. <laughs> you remember Looney Tunes and Porky Pig? And then I said, well, it's got all these things here. And so I put these lightning bolts and thunders. And then I started thinking, man, that looks like album covers that uh, people used to have of, of rock and roll music and stuff like that, doesn't it? Kind of look. And then I'm eyes all over them. Doesn't that kind of remind you some of these album covers or this wicked satanic music? And, th and I thought, you know what? Satan's been there. <laughs> Satan knows what he's seen and he's trying to show people too. And so he's like making a mockery of the real thing. That was my thought. And I thought, man, that's weird. So it looks weird, I know, but uh, there's the 24 elders around, and there's the sea, sea of glass. Okay, I don't have time to get into the sea of glass. But uh, what an interesting thing the Bible talks about here. And I, I'd love to see it and see what John saw. It sounds wild. It sounds like it'd be so hard to write down, wouldn't it, <laughs> to see all that stuff? And it sounds like maybe somebody had a little bit too much pizza before they went to bed one night and had a weird dream is what it sounds like. But it's real. It's in the Bible. That's what you would see in the spirit world. So let's continue there in verse 7 and 8. Okay? So it talks about four beasts. Verse 7, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So on your little handout there, I put those. Put them up here too. What are these beasts? Verse 8, And the four beasts had... Each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within. And, and it continues there. I'll read the rest of that here in a minute. But they had eyes all on them. And then they have six wings. Why would you need six wings? Wouldn't two be enough? So I tried to put six wings on each one. Uh, it's weird. It's really weird, but that's what the Bible says. So I believe it because that's what he saw. And guess what? There's another person out there that saw the same thing, and that would be Ezekiel. So let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 1, and let's look at that. Um, the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So amazing. A lot of times you read something in the New Testament that's found in the Old Testament. Revelation corresponds a lot with Daniel. Well, here we're reading Revelation, and what we just read corresponds to something that Ezekiel saw. So Ezekiel chapter 1. Verse 1, he talks about the time that he saw a vision. Okay, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Interesting. Well, it sounds like a door opened in heaven almost, right? And uh, skip down to verse uh, 4. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Now, amber is kind of an opaque stone, isn't it? That you can see through. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they 
four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not. When they went, they went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, well, this sounds just like what we read in Revelation. Look at this. Had the face of a man, had the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Now, ox is a little bit different. But have you ever seen a baby calf? Have you ever seen a baby ox? They look pretty close, don't they? Hard to tell the difference, actually. So that's not an error in the King James Bible or anything like that. The two guys are looking at something and they said, it looked like this to me. Well, it looks like that to me. Well, they look the same to me, so I don't see a problem there. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward whither the spirit was to go. They went and they turned not when they went. Oh, I'd love to read the rest here. I guess we have to. I'll try to skip as I can, but this is kind of long, but I want you to see how this corresponds with Revelation. Verse 13, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Okay, we saw that in Revelation. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Well, there was sounded like lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels. Uh, he goes on there and talks about some wheels. Okay, um, Look at verse 27. We'll skip down there. And I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw it was it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. But look at verse 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. That's a rainbow. That's what it said in Revelation. And uh, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And then look what he says. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. <laughs> I would too, wouldn't you? And I heard a voice of one that spake. So clearly, it's the same God in the Old Testament as Jesus Christ in the New Testament. I don't see how you could be a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> That right there ought to show you, oh, that was Jesus. This is Jesus, right? So let's go back to Revelation and uh, chapter 4. But we have four creatures. And uh, who knows what these are? Again, it's the spirit world, whatever they are. But there's four of them. But what's missing? What's missing here? We would call these cherubs. These would be called cherubs or cherubim. Whenever you see M on the end, that's Hebrew for more than one. Did you know there was another one there? And he's not there anymore? So what you have here is you have four. But at one time, there were five. And here's Jesus in the middle. Kind of looks like you could connect those as a star, couldn't you? Doesn't that look like a star? Who would this one have been? Now, so we see a lion and we see a calf. That's mammals. That reminds us of mammals. One's domesticated, one's wild. Then we see an eagle. That's fowl. We see a man. What's missing? We're missing amphibian class. Amphibian, if I spell it right. What is an amphibian? Well, frogs, snakes, dragons, things like that. Gators. Amen. Um, interesting. Well, do you know what the Bible calls Satan? Let's go over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that would be amphibian, that old serpent, that's amphibian, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So Satan is identified as a snake, as an amphibian, as a serpent, as a dragon. So in the Bible, and I'm going to show you the verses here, at one time before he fell, Satan set up here, and he was the fifth, the fifth cherub. And you know what he did? He fell. So you see how I drew a star here? What if it was an upside down star? Point down, because he fell. That's what to this day, Luciferians and Satanists use to remember Satan. He's the one that fell. So they take a star and they point it down. Did you know that? That's a cult 101 right there. I don't even, I'm going to erase that because I don't even like to look at that. That's such a horrible symbol. But that's the symbol of Satanism. Why? They remember Satan's rebelling against God because they're all like, I'm going to rebel against God. 
and they use their, well, I was going to show the symbol they use, but I don't want to. People will take a, a still shot and go, oh, breakers of Satanists, you know. But you know that. Hook them horns. They take this finger up and this finger up and this finger out. And that's a sign of Satan, the devil horns, right? So let's look at this. Go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, and verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, he's talking to a king on earth here, but through the prophet, God is speaking to Satan inside this man. And how do we know that? Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Does this king that lived about 588 B.C., did he live in the garden of No. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, the burl, it goes on and on. There's jasper right there. There's, there's emeralds. God loves precious stones. That's interesting. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What stones would those be from what we've just read? Revelation and Ezekiel. Jasper and sardine, as among others. Thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Who is this fellow? Satan. And uh, he's called, well, actually, his name is Lucifer before he fell. But he's called the anointed cherub that what? Covereth. So here he was up there on top. And then he fell. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and this is not speaking of Jesus Christ. You get a new version of the Bible, sometimes in their notes they'll say, we think this is Jesus. <laughs> then you, sir, are wrong. This is not Jesus Christ. This is Lucifer or Satan. King James translators translated it right when they put Lucifer, because that's who it's speaking of. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Okay, they changed that to morning star in new versions of the Bible. Do you know who the morning star is? Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star. Don't you go changing the Bible. Now you're confusing Satan with Jesus and vice versa. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That's five eyes. 5G. I wonder if that has anything. No, I don't know. But five eyes. I, I, I. And an uh, iPhone. Hmm, interesting. Anyway, uh, but he says there, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So Satan is like, I'm going to go back up there and take over. And God says, Nope. And I spell anointed wrong. And God said, Nope. No, you're not. So Satan was cast out of heaven. I personally don't think that Satan can go back up into heaven. I think he can't go across that sea, that sea of glass. But before, he was way up there. So he's a loser, isn't he? Why would you follow a loser? Why would you follow Lucifer? I don't understand. So he tried to overthrow God, and that's why there were five up there. Now there's only four. And that's interesting, and that's something quite interesting. And it's it just interesting, too, that when we think of a star, we draw a star like this. Isn't that weird? On all the airplanes in America, what do they have? Oh, look at this. Now, those are supposed to represent wings, maybe. I don't know. Are, are they saying, hey, we're remembering Lucifer or Satan every time they draw that star? Stars are supposed to be angels. Lucifer's a fallen angel. So, interesting, is it not? So, now back to, uh, to Revelation chapter 3. Or, excuse me, I keep saying 3. I remember last week. Revelation chapter 4. And let's finish this. Have you all learned anything so far? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have a tendency to just give you too much information. But hey, it's going online and hopefully it'll be a blessing to people. So that's your upside down star where it comes from. And uh, that's why when I see an upside down star, I know I'm dealing with something satanic. And a lot of the album covers that people in my generation grew up listening to had those upside down stars. All those kind of, uh, uh, what do they call that music? The heavy metal music and things like that you got to be careful of that stuff. There was one called Black Sabbath. You ever heard of Black Sabbath? And um, I had a tape years ago, and, and uh, somebody erased it on accident, where that Black Sabbath was playing in concert, and then they started speaking in tongues. 
Yeah, just like a Pentecostal church. And someone recorded it, took it home, played it backwards, and it was an altar call to Satan in perfect English, backwards. That's what Satan does. He does things backwards because he hates God. So watch out for those musics. Hollywood and uh, music industry, full of Luciferianism. Watch out for upside down stars. Watch out for people that worship Lucifer. There are a lot of secret societies that worship Lucifer. Probably the biggest one is the Masons. And I have the books from the Masons. When they die, they're supposed to give them back to the Masons. But sometimes I'll garage sale and I'll find a Mason book and I'll read it. And it says, our religion is the oldest religion. It is the worship of Lucifer. But they don't tell you that until you get up to the 33rd degree. If you're just in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you don't know that. But it's all to get you to that guy who fell. Kind of sad. So let's finish this up now. Revelation chapter 4. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying... Notice what these four beasts say. If this is what they've always said, then Satan had to have said this at one time. Hmm. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Now, if that's not the Trinity, I'll eat your dirty socks. The people out there, there's no Trinity. <laughs> well, then why are they saying it three times? I think they're standing there looking... The Father, the Son, and then what represents the Spirit. And they're like, holy, 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 holy. You know, because God is one in three, but those three are one. So interesting that they say it three times. The Lord, that'd be Jesus Christ. God, that'd be the Father. And then Almighty. Well, how is He almighty and all-powerful? Through the Spirit. There's power through the Spirit. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever... The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying. So when they do that, then the 24 elders do that. Sounds like they're doing it over and over. And over. Don't you know their legs are probably hurting? I mean, I don't know. But they're doing this over and over again. That's amazing to see that. I guess it's on the other side. Those 24. Nope, I don't have the 24 elders up here. But the 24 elders around there. And they're casting their crowns at Jesus' feet. Now, what do they say? This is one of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. In this world in which we live, people that hate God in the Bible, that are atheists, they talk about how smart they are when they get this education from a secular school. Many of them become what's called a philosopher. And they say, oh, I'm so smart, and I'm a philosopher, and I can write. And you go to the libraries, you will find volumes of books written by philosophers claiming to know what the meaning of life is, why we're here, what's it all about. And it's all junk. It's the most boringest stuff you've ever read in your life. And it's meaningless because they make it all about them. <laughs> and it's not about you. It's about him. It's about God. So why are we here? This verse gives us three words. We can take the whole library and all those books and throw them out. And in three words, we can sum it up. What they tried in volumes of books to write. Why are we here? Three words. My dad used to go around and ask people, why are we here? In three words or less. And people go, oh, and my dad would answer it. What are the three words? Let's go ahead and read the verse. Verse 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things. Amen. He's the creator. Who is this? This is Jesus Christ. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. So what is the purpose of us here? Why are we even here? What, what's our being? What, are we just one big giant accident when the universe tooted one day? I mean, that's what they call it, the Great Bang. Boom. Oh, we're all here. What are we here for? We don't know. I can sum it up in three words or less. The meaning of everything. For His pleasure. We are here to please God. How are you doing? You doing a good job at that? Let's go to Hebrews eleven twenty five 25 so I can close. Sadly, a lot of people don't even understand why they're here. You're here to please your Creator. But yet most people only live to please themselves. That's all they care about, self-gratification. It says here in Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, speaking of Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God 
than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For His pleasure, we're here to please God. A lot of people would rather sin. And what is sin? Pleasing yourself instead of God. Now that doesn't mean there's, there's pleasures you can't have in this life. There's a lot of pleasures we can have in this life that are right. I like to surf and sail and fish and, and do all sorts of things in the water. I, there's lots of things that pleases me to do in this life that aren't sin. But a lot of people, they just want to do the things that are sin, that pleases their flesh. When the Bible says we're supposed to be here to please Him. So let me ask you this in closing. Are you pleasing the Lord? Someday you're going to stand up there and see this. And I wonder if the Lord's going to say, well, what'd you do to please me? And what'd you do to please yourself? And then I guess you put them side by side and see which list is longer. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sad to know that we did more for ourselves than we did for Jesus? Every head bowed, every eye closed. No, no, I won't do that. But I'm just saying, wouldn't, wouldn't that be something? I, I want to be pleasing to the Lord. And that's why I surrendered to the ministry and surrendered to, to serve Him. And I do everything I can to try to tell people about Jesus. Because He's the only way. And if you reject Him, you're not going to be pleased. <laughs> you're going to be suffering in torment for all eternity. But when you trust Him as your Savior, when you get to heaven, it's bliss for all eternity. Now you can please yourself and do whatever you want. And it's not sin. And we can actually enjoy living. <laughs> I hate living sometimes. Now, I'm not going to commit suicide, but I'm just saying, sometimes I, I, I realize I'm my own worst enemy. I do stupid things. I say dumb things. I mess up. I'm not what I should be. I don't always please the Lord. I'm kicking myself, and I just, ugh, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the one the Lord created me to be. Do you? Well, all right. <laughs> Amen. I think... Enough has been said, right? I hope this has been a blessing to you. Read this passage over again. Think about these things. And um, think about your life. Are you truly pleasing to the Lord? And uh, try to please Him more before He comes. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank You for this. Thank You for the opportunity to get a glimpse of heaven today. Thank You, Lord, also for the, the rebuke, Lord, that You give us in this wonderful chapter. Help us, Lord, to, to look at ourselves and... And uh, try to please you more, Lord, and get those sins out of our lives that so easily beset us. And help us to do more for you so that you'd be pleased with us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.